This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So uh, I thought I would end by saying a few words about obesity, both from a public health uh, standpoint as well as uh, clinical care. One of my uh, hobbies at UCSF is I did start a weight management program back in the 1980s. In the 1980s, again, as I sort of told you half my story, the second half of the story was when I uh, joined the faculty and, and started my primary care practice and teaching primary care. I was always looking for that interface between nutrition and uh, in internal medicine and primary care practice and uh, uh, early on realized that um, the work was not in the hospital but the work was in the clinic and the community. So we did start a small weight management program. It's still going on. We have a terrific team of uh, physicians and dietitians and psychologists who work with us. Uh, we're happy to see uh, 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 any of your uh, patients uh, for, uh, at that site. So just, uh, you've heard the, the basic uh, numbers before. Um, about a third of Americans are defined as obese. Two thirds are defined as overweight. There are some uh, gender differences. Um, obesity in this uh, definition is defined primarily, uh, well exclusively by the body mass index, uh, which is uh, your weight divided by your height squared in the metric system. Why do we use the body mass index? Because as a surrogate measure of, of two easily measured things, your height and weight, it correlates extremely well with total, total body fat. And remember, obesity is an excess of fat. It's not an excess of weight. Um, as Katie mentioned, though, there are many other factors, uh, most particularly uh, the location of the body fat. So all fat is not equal. And, uh, and clinically, uh, now with electronic health records uh, uh, and meaningful use criteria, everyone is getting a height and a weight measured. It used to be that only about half of patients who walked into the office had a height and weight measured. Uh, now it's much more common because it's part of meaningful use uh, uh, criteria. Uh, but we're st what we're still not doing is interpreting that data uh, correctly. So patients are still not being told the results and they're not uh, necessarily being told correctly what it all means. So we think of the BMI as a screening test, and like any good screening test, you then have to do a second, more specific and, uh, diagnostic test to really think through, are you dealing with obesity that's an illness, or are you dealing with uh, a high body mass index, which may or may not be related to disease? And uh, let me go through that a little bit. So in the United States, it's about 6%. Now, um, depending on... Um, what you read and what data sets you're looking at, this doesn't project particularly well. Uh, but this is um, to demonstrate the point that although in of the last four decades, the first three was associated with this marked increase in body weight in the United States, that um, the most recent decade between 2000 and 2010 has not shown any further increase. So this is a little bit confusing because there's a lot of obesity out there. It's leading to an increase in diabetes. But the prevalence of obesity in the society has sort of stabilized. And that's true in adults and children on average. Uh, there are subpopulations that we'll talk about. So this just compares the distribution of body mass indexes in the two decades. And you can see the lines are superimposable. Uh, and there are a variety of other ways to present this data. But uh, yes, we're in an epidemic of obesity, but the rate of increase is actually flattened. Um, and so weights have uh, relatively stabilized. And we don't know why that is, whether we fit some biological cap, um, uh, whether the people who are really severely overweight are dying, um, and so uh, not showing up in these databases, 
or whether some of the public health measures uh, and attention we've put to this is beginning to show an effect. Uh, and uh, the, roughly the numbers are the same in children. Um, uh, the prevalence of severe obesity is now 12% in children. Uh, the, uh, obesity is defined a little bit differently in kids based on growth curves, um, but it's about half the rate that it is in adults. Uh, but luckily here, too, it appears on average to be stabilizing, although there are pockets where it's still increasing. Now, here's a trick question that the pediatricians in the room will get, but the rest of us who take care of adults might not. If severe obesity is defined as the 90, being above the 97th percentile in weight, how can the incidence be anything other than 3%? Right? It took me a while to figure this out as an adult physician. Um, and the answer is because this is the 97th percentile of the standards from the 1960s and 70s. So it's a trick question if some of you were bothered by that number. And these are the prevalence data from the CDC in children, so generally flat, uh, but with some pockets of increase in uh, Latino children and African American children. There are tremendous health disparities in uh, obesity. Again, uh, I've just cherry-picked uh, two particular groups uh, to highlight this, but you can go through any uh, age and demographic, uh, age and gender uh, subset and find these disparities. Uh, but looking, for example, in middle-aged women, uh, much higher prevalence of obesity in blacks and, and Latinos compared to uh, whites, and uh, same in uh, teenagers. And, uh, of course, one of the hidden epidemics of uh, obesity is in the mentally ill, uh, where the prevalence, instead of being 60 per 65 percent, is 83 percent. Some of that is due to socio socioeconomic factors uh, and uh, ho housing and food insecurity and things like that. But some of it is also related to the medications we use to treat severe obesity, which are associated with weight gain. And of course, there are tremendous uh, regional and geographic disparities. Uh, the darker colors here. Uh, uh, this burnt red uh, is the highest rate of obesity uh, in any uh, by uh, by state, and so you can see the southeast uh, has been, uh, if you will, a hot spot, no pun intended, for uh, obesity in the United States uh, uh, for decades. Of course, there are many others. You could change uh, the word obesity here to many, many, many other demographic factors, uh, where there is also a prevalence of. Uh, uh, increase in the southeast, poverty, for example, and food insecurity, and, and many, many other fa factors. But obesity is particularly severe in the southeast. Um, Colorado has the least obesity, uh, and California also does uh, relatively well, although, as you know, uh, California is not really one state. It's many, many states, and depending on which part of the state you slice, uh, the rates are actually quite high uh, in parts of the Central Valley and so forth. Uh, all right, here's a thought exercise. Uh, we don't have our clickers, but this is sort of fun. Um, for a 40-year-old woman with normal metabolic blood tests along the lines of what uh, Katie was uh, suggesting, blood sugar, blood pressure, blood lipids, uh, in good health, uh, which body mass index is associated with the lowest all-cause mortality? In other words, at what weight would we predict she would be likely to live the longest? Um, okay. All right. Well, let's vote. All right. We'll do a vote. I was going to do this as a thought exercise, but I can see you're into it. So let's do it. All right. So all in. So it's 18, 24, 28, 34, and 38. And I've defined them um, uh, for you. So uh, just to be precise, well, they're, they're, I won't be precise. The number, it's, it says what it says. Uh, so all in favor of 18. So uh, it can't be too thin or too rich. 24. Right, that makes sense, right? Normal is normal. Over 28, ooh, some people think that being a little chunky is uh, the healthiest <laughs> weight. Uh, obese class one, we divide obesity in class one, class two, and class three, 30 to 35, 35 to 40, and over 40. Uh, class one, and, and no one thinks class two. All right, good. So let's look at the data, and uh, some of you are right, but not all of you. <laughs> so here are the definitions. Um, Less than eight, and it reflects the last slide. So less than 18 and a half is underweight. Uh, normal is 18 and a half to 20, uh, 25. Then overweight is this category 25 to 30, and then the three stages of obesity. 
But again, remember, this is based upon a single measurement, the body mass index, which is your weight divided by your height squared, uh, um, uh, a reflection of total body fat, and that is not the disease. The disease are strokes and heart disease and diabetes and kidney disease and so forth. Those are the diseases. So I skipped over the issue of is obesity a disease, and sometimes obesity is a disease and sometimes obesity is a risk factor for disease, and that's why we have these debates um, about that. So here's uh, the data that raises some interesting questions, and um, this was the first study that raised this, but there have now been over a dozen. Uh, so it's a lot of information here. So just focus on this column here just for the sake of uh, the first slide, the first moment. So it breaks down uh, long-term life expectancy as a function of body mass index. And this, what was good about the study, it was done by the CDC and reflected and Haynes is this uh, uh, governmentally run uh, uh, health and nutrition survey that's done every five to 10 years. And what they did was combine the data from three different versions of the study. So it was a big, big data set over about a 15 to 20 year period. And they used as the frame of reference the normal body weight uh, and then compared the underweight and overweight to this. So the first thing you see is that the people who are too thin, or who are thin, underweight, die 38 percent more often and that's mostly due to cigarettes uh, so even if you take out the people who die the first year so some people have hidden illness uh, there's still an increase and the increase is uh, associated with uh, cigarette use uh, if you take out cigarettes this number approaches one um, so being too thin is not a risk factor as long as you're not ill either uh, with any kind of illness including mental illness uh, and if you don't smoke. Uh, the, the, we know that obesity is associated with increased risk, but it wasn't four times greater, it was double. Um, and that's, in, in 10, 10, 20 years ago, this number might have been four. So the amount of excess mortality from obesity seems to be decreasing. Uh, not the amount of obesity, but the attributable risk from obesity and we think that's probably because we're much better now at treating obesity-related complications, particularly lipids and blood pressure. So the use of statins and blood pressure medications in the obese has decreased the excess mortality in that cohort. But here's the most interesting number. So that the people who are overweight did not have any excess mortality. And so what we've been saying for years is that there's no longer something called an ideal body weight. Some of you are old enough to remember the metropolitan life curves and frame sizes and things like that. So we go away from saying there's a specific weight that everyone should be. Rather, we think of a ex range of acceptable weights. Uh, and what this data would suggest is that, ra uh, th that range of acceptable weights maybe should be wider. Again, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> that... That, that you can be uh, anywhere from uh, 18 to maybe 30 uh, and not have a lot of excess mortality. Uh, it's also worth noting that in your eighth decade, obesity is no longer a risk factor at all. Uh, so as people get older, uh, weight um, is, is more dangerous to be underweight and frail than it is to be a little overweight. I think uh, I have to show it to get the, explain the answer. So then there was another study. This was a meta-analysis of 100 studies uh, of over th almost three million people. And just to really confuse things, not only did they confirm that finding, uh, that overweight was um, not associated with increased risk compared to uh, norm so-called normal weight, um, but even, uh, but overweight was only slightly increased risk. And then when you broke down overweight, uh, those that were in uh, 30 to 35, so now technically obese, uh, but just a little uh, obese, um, uh, we're doing fine too. And then most of the excess risk came from uh, grade two and grade three obesity. So this is not proof, this is more, this is observational, this is hypothesis generating kind of data. Uh, but it certainly suggests that people in the overweight category, um, just by definition, uh, are not necessarily uh, at risk, unless they are. So the take home message is that if someone's in the overweight category, you need to evaluate them metabolically and see if they have a BMI with metabolic abnormalities or a BMI without metabolic abnormalities and other risks. Uh, of course, you would also do that in people of normal weight because, uh, as Katie mentioned, uh, there are many people with normal body mass index who still have lipid disorders, uh, diabetes, blood sugar disorders, and the like. 
So uh, the provocative correct answer is all three of these, although I think this is really still a hypothesis. Uh, but it certainly suggests that maybe we should redefine uh, our definition of normal to include being a little overweight as long as you're otherwise metabolically normal uh, and fit. And so we'll talk about that next. Okay. Um, take a minute to look at this cartoon. It takes a, takes a while. Takes a while to fi takes a while to figure out what's happening. Um, so uh, I think the other slide I showed said 50 percent, but about 50, 60 percent of people in the United States don't exercise regularly, and 25 percent of people hardly do anything. So one myth uh, is that exercise is really important for weight loss. And that's a myth. Um, the truth is that this is the only bad thing I'm going to say about exercise, but I'm a truth teller. Um, exercise is ineffective at short-term weight loss. Now, it's terrific for other things that I'll come to in a minute. But if you look at the randomized trials, again, large number of randomized trials, and compare people who uh, exercise, go on a, a weight loss diet, and it can be any one of uh, uh, several types of uh, low calorie balance, whatever, low carb, it doesn't matter, diets, and then add exercise to the diet in one group in a randomized way and not to the other group, the amount of excess weight lost in the exercise group is quite trivial. Um, if you, there's a little bit of a dose effect if you exercise a lot, and you've all seen the TV shows where people really, really exercise a lot, and sure enough, yeah, if you exercise all day, uh, you can lose some weight. But these are typically the way uh, we prescribe exercise, which would be uh, 30, to, uh, 30 to 60 minutes of uh, moderate exercise most days of the week. I'll come back to that. But at that dose, uh, the amount of, the amount of uh, um, weight that's lost as part of a weight loss program is quite modest. Now, everything else gets better. So there's no question that metabolically exercise is good for your blood sugar, blood, blood pressure, lipids, and so forth. But in terms of weight loss, and anyone who's ever been on an exercise machine, you know, and you, you're on that stair climber or elliptical for, you know, 40 minutes, and then it says I just burned 300 calories, you know, and then I just had my muffin for 1,200, you know, you know it doesn't work. So, um, uh, but it doesn't. Now, that's the only bad thing I'm going to say about exercise, because exercise is good for everything else. Um, but it is important to know that to lose weight, you have to eat less calories, and it has to be about a quarter less than you're eating now, as I discussed earlier. If you want to lose a pound a week, if you eat 12% less than you normally eat, you lose a half a pound a week. So this is uh, this uh, sort of study that we also referred to earlier about uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, fitness uh, trumping fatness. Uh, so this comes from um, the Aerobic Center, uh, the Cooper Institute in Texas, but there have been many, many other uh, data sets that have showed the same thing. And again, a lot of numbers here. Let me just focus you on the bottom here, which is again looking at mortality, which is our hardest endpoint. And what they did was they took a bunch of people who were normal body weight, body mass index under, th uh, under 25, and used them as the reference point. And then they put people on a treadmill and did measured oxy oxygen production and so forth, uh, fairly sophisticated measures of fitness. <clears throat> and those that were uh, uh, fit and normal body weight were used as the comparison group. So if you are on the treadmill, and even though you're normal body weight, if you can't exercise, your risk of dying in the next decade uh, is double. So we've known this for a long time. Sedentary lifestyle is an important risk factor of uh, premature mortality and also cardiovascular mortality. Uh, old news, uh, but this demonstrates that. We also know that if you're obese, most people who are obese are not fit, and they also don't do as well. Uh, uh, in this case, three times our, our risk of uh, premature mortality in a decade. But here's the, here's the magic corner. All right, so the people whose body mass index was over 30 who were fit did just fine. Um, and again, up here, uh, not, uh, not quite as perfect, but again, same idea that this group was doing well. Now, what this study suggested, if you take it one step further, is that this corner here, the people who were obese and fit, not only did better than the people who were obese and not fit, and that's true in every study, but in this study, the people who were obese and fit even did better than the thin people who were not fit. So this is where the phrase fitness trumps fatness comes from. 
Now, not every study shows that this is better than this, but every study does show that this is better than this. So what that suggests is that the goal number one related to obesity has nothing to do with weight at all. It has to do with fitness. So one of my uh, number one rules of thumb is be as fit as you can be at the weight you're at. And we'll come to that at the end. This is a similar study that shows the same thing. So that's all I'm going to say about exercise uh, in this context. Uh, I, except, actually, that's not true. There's one more thing I'm going to say in a minute. So just a few words about diets. And I think I'm going to go through this quickly. Uh, I think we touched on most of these uh, points. And I won't uh, dwell on the point, but for many, many years, and I made my Johnny Carson joke earlier, but um, uh, for many years, there have been debates about low carb versus high carb and, and so forth. And there are now about two dozen studies that have randomized people to one of these diets. So Atkins versus Ornish, or Atkins versus Zone, or in this particular study, it was all four of them. Uh, and the bottom line is that in none of these diets do people lose a lot of weight. In all of these diets, there's a high dropout rate. Um, that people who stay on the diet do better than people who don't stay on the diet, duh. Um, and that there was no difference based on diet type. The predictor was adherence. So if you start a diet and your goal is short-term weight loss, if you stick on that diet, and there are only a few out there that, to which this doesn't apply, but it can be any of the diets we've talked about so far, the new Atkins, which is much better than the old Atkins, or South Beach, or The Zone, or Weight Watchers, or a vegan diet, or a vegetarian, or a pesco vegetarian, or whatever you want to do, as long as you stick, it, stick to it uh, and eat less calories than you, we estimate you need, you'll lose weight. It's also worth noting that uh, so f these numbers that I just showed on the last slide are averages. But around each average, there's a Gaussian distribution of response, which means some people do worse and gain weight, even though they're on a diet, but some people do better. Uh, and so there's always a tail, if you will, of people who lose a lot more weight. So the idea to say that diets don't work is just not true. I mean, diets do what diets do, that diets are there. First of all, everything we eat is a diet. So, um, but a weight loss diet, a short-term weight loss diet can be effective for short-term weight loss. Now, it's not effective for long-term weight loss, but it's a short-term weight loss diet. So uh, you can also use uh, more aggressive calorie restriction. There are things out there called very low-calorie diets. We do do this at UCSF. We put people on 800 calories a day or 1,000 calories a day instead of 1,500 calories a day, and they lose twice as much weight. So on an average diet, in general, people lose between 7 to 10 percent of their starting body weight. Uh, seven, I, I always think of it as 7.5. This particular study shows 9, but it's between 5 and 10 percent. Uh, so if you weigh 200 pounds and you go on a diet for six months, you'll lose about 15 pounds. So it's really important for people to know that, because if they're 300 pounds and they go on a diet for six months, they're going to lose 20 pounds. And that probably wasn't what they had in mind. And so it's important to uh, understand the numbers. But very low calorie diets do twice as well in the short term, but not any better in the long term. Uh, so we use this option for people who need to lose a lot of weight quick. So we have patients on very high doses of insulin, for example, who can get off insulin this way um, with type 2 diabetes, or if someone uh, is preparing for bariatric surgery and needs to lose 100 pounds, or someone's having their knees replaced, uh, or can't get it on a transplant list because they're overweight, uh, this is a tactic that's available. But it works for short-term weight loss, but it can be done safely. So my conclusions on diets are sort of similar to what we said before. Uh, in my opinion, the type of diet does not really matter for weight loss. Uh, it, again, that doesn't matter that I'm advocating a junk food weight loss diet. I'm advocating the things I was advocating, still advocating the things I was advocating this morning. Um, but, uh, but you have some macronutrient flexibility amongst the healthy foods as long as you're uh, uh, under your calorie intake. Sticking the diet does matter. Calories trump macronutrients uh, and select healthy nutrient-rich foods uh, to achieve those that uh, lower calorie intake. I think I'll, uh, so some weight loss diet tips. If uh, This is true for yourself as well as your patients. Uh, we talk a lot about motivational interviewing and stages of change and trying to assess whether patients are ready to lose weight, set realistic expectations along the lines of that, what we can predict. 
choose a diet that's easy to follow, follow and compatible with the lifestyle. And Katie showed some of the uh, eth uh, culturally competent uh, dietary options that are available. Uh, you uh, focus on portion size. Uh, the plate method is a good way to do that. Um, uh, and, uh, and other techniques for teaching people portion sizes, again, and same principles um, that we talked about. Now, one of the things I talk about with patients right from the beginning, though, is that maintaining the weight you lose is key. So if, if you're on a weight loss program and, the, and you want to lose weight, but don't have a strategy for keeping it off once you lose it, why bother? Uh, so I jokingly tell the story of I, 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 a guy from the San Francisco Chronicle advertised me, uh, adver uh, interviewed me, and you know we were going through a whole bunch of diet books and stuff, and you know he said, well, Dr. Barron, what is what what what's your diet? It was before I had come up with the generic diet, which is of course no diet, uh, and uh, but I was uh, I was just sitting there thinking, so I said, my book, my my diet's the forever diet. Uh, you know that is to say. When you make the commitment to lose weight, the diet you need to lose weight at the beginning has to be the same diet that you're going to use to keep the weight off forever. And I'll show you some numbers to, to produce that. Unfortunately, I never wrote that book. No one would have bought it anyway because everyone wants the tomorrow diet, not the forever diet. Um, but I'm, I'm still thinking about it. Fed up with how her diet is going, Charlene takes a more serious aim at her target weight. <laughs> All right, I do have to show you this one. All right, so a 40-year-old woman, uh, uh, class two obesity, body mass index is 36. Much to your surprise and satisfaction, she's lost 35 pounds. In order to maintain her new weight, her lifelong daily calorie intake should be. <coughs> Uh, and let's assume in, the, in this case that she, at the beginning, before you met her, needed about 2,000 calories to maintain her body weight. And so the question is, now that she's lost some weight, she wants to go back to her original diet, what number should she go back to? What, what calorie intake will you prescribe for her? Uh, 2,000, 1,800, 1,600, 1,400, 1,200, all right? We can vote. All in favor of 2,000. That was her starting weight, so back to baseline. Good. 1,800. Good. People. Uh, beginning to think that maybe she needs less. 1,600, so that's the majority opinion. 1,400, no takers. 1,200, no takers. All right, so none of you are right. <laughs> All right, so the, a lot of this data comes from something called the National Weight Control Registry, which is a collection of patients who have lost weight and kept it off. It's run out of uh, Colorado. To get in, you needed to have lose, lost 30 pounds and kept it off for a year. Um, but actually, these people have lost double that and kept it off for much longer. It's mostly a Caucasian, Colorado um, uh, cohort, uh, mostly women, mostly Caucasian, so some limitations on generalizability. It, uh, some of them were overweight as a child, though, and some of them had a family history of obesity, uh, making the point that early onset obesity and family history obesity is not a destiny to prove that you can never lose weight. Uh, clearly, some of uh, obesity is genetic, but uh, you can still uh, lose weight. And here are some of the things they do. There's a lot of different things they do, uh, but here are my three, the three most important. Number one, they exercise a ton. Number two, they eat a diet low in calories. And number three, they monitor their weight. So exercise a ton, an hour of moderate intensity per day. And so ironically, when you, have, when you read federal recommendations to say, to prevent weight gain, you need to exercise an hour a day. This is actually the data from whence that recommendation comes. So a bit of a leap uh, to recommend for the public at large an hour a day when, in fact, uh, that's what this cohort of women are doing. But nonetheless, this is what this cohort of women is doing. Uh, so it's an hour a day, moderate intensity, if you're doing, which is brisk walking, you know, three to four uh, miles per hour kind of walking. Um, and I should have said earlier, my definition of fitness, akin to that other study, is if you can walk, uh, three to four miles an hour, talk while you're doing it, do it for an hour, and wake up the next day and the day after that, and the day after that, and do it again and again. Uh, that's the definition of fitness in that other study, and also for, uh, my pra for pr good practice. Uh, so they exercise when you figure out how many calories a day this works out to be. I mean, a week, it's about 25 or 3,000 calories or per week, and, uh, and almost all of them exercise. So an hour a day, um, what I usually say to patients is, 
uh, that exercise should be biblical. Uh, six days a week of exercise, one day of rest. Um, and um, again, I'm, I'm flexible whether that, what day of the week that rest day is. You know, all denominations are fine. Um, and if patients want to exercise seven days a week, that's also okay as long as they can do it without overuse injuries. So uh, you have to work on different muscle groups and so forth. Remember, we talk about exercise, we mostly talk about cardiovascular exercise, but resistance training has a role. And there are two other components of fitness. So there's cardiovascular and strength, but there's also balance and flexibility. So remember, as you're working on your uh, fitness, uh, to also include those, especially as you get older. So not too much of a surprise here, except that the dose is higher than most people expect. And the other thing I'll say is that, uh, at least for most adult patients uh, in a pra and working people, people raising families, I think by far and away the best thing is to exercise early in the morning. You know, if you, uh, if you wait till later in the day, there's always, you're tired, there's always a reason not to do it. So I always tell patients, you know, never go to bed today without knowing when you're going to exercise tomorrow. And most of the time that means just back calculating your day. You know when you have to be somewhere. So I had to be here at you know, 7.30, so I, I knew it was taking a half an hour to get here. And I, I had to back calculate when I had to get up in order to get my exercise in before I came. So that way it's done. I don't have to worry about it today. I can have a glass of wine at 5, and I don't have to uh, exercise. So uh, you know, do it early in the morning. All right, here's the other take-home point. These women eat 1,400 calories a day. So they needed 2,000 to break even. They got smaller. Uh, their body metabolically slowed down. Uh, their uh, energy metabolism decreased. And in order to maintain their body weight, it's 1,400 calories a day. Now, again, a Gaussian distribution around this average, um, but it's really low. And that's where the idea of the forever diet comes from, because 1,400 calorie diets is a weight loss dose if you need 2,000. But when it gets to weight maintenance, now it's not a weight loss dose anymore. It's a weight maintenance dose. Uh, so that's where people get confused. If you go back to 2000 or, uh, or 1800, they'll gain the weight back. Most of these people are brazers rather than bingers. They eat a small amount throughout the day. Um, and uh, they almost never eat fast food. And they monitor their weight carefully, uh, either daily or weekly. So 1400 calories is, quote, the correct answer. I'll just show you two slides about uh, drugs, and then uh, two or three slides about drugs, and two or three slides about uh, surgery. Um, so this is the cartoon uh, that we showed to the medical students about the neuroendocrinology of energy balance or control of appetite. And as, as UCSF alums, you know that any time a professor shows you a slide with this many arrows, is because they don't have a clue as to what's going on. Um, but and basically, the take-home message here is that appetite is hard to control, uh, that there are many factors in the control of appetite. And the take-home message is that there's a tremendous amount of biologic redundancy. Remember, we are programmed to preserve our weight. So if you inhibit one of these pathways, one of these other pathways, just crank it up. right? So. The idea that we're going to find a chemical to block one of these that's going to cause weight loss is highly, highly unlikely. And that's why you're beginning to see in the, in the weight loss research realm uh, use of combinations of drugs. So this, if this ever works, uh, and I'll define what I mean by work in just a moment, if this ever works, it's going to be uh, because of using multiple medications that are attacking this from multiple different pathways. Not unlike the way we treat cancer, not unlike the way we treat hypertension, not unlike the way we treat uh, diabetes. It's unlikely to be the way we treat lipids. You know, with lipids, we did find the magic bullet, we think, uh, and it is saving lives. Uh, but with these other conditions, it, it takes multiple pathways. So uh, we're not holding our breath for a single medication. And there are a lot of medications out there, and I'm not going to go through. This is an old list. There are now some newer ones, but it makes the point that the average amount of weight loss is about 5% of your starting weight. And remember, I told you diets are 5 to 10%. So the amount of benefit you get from uh, most medications is quite modest uh, compared to um, a good diet and exercise program. So we don't use them. And, and, the, and the reason we don't use them is, A, they don't work, and B, they really don't work. Um, 
So, and, and what I mean by that is that to get these drugs approved, all you need to do is show a certain amount of weight loss or a certain number of patients that have lost a certain amount of weight. Um, and so, so that's why some of these drugs, the FDA rejects them, and then there's a new, few new people on the panel, and the next vote, they accept the drug, and then it goes to the full panel, and they reject the drug, and the stock goes up, and the stock goes down. And it's, it's all based on very soft data. And the FDA has gotten much stricter on this because of this study. Uh, and so Cybutramine, uh, as you know, Meridia was around for a while, and it was the, our, everyone's favorite drug. I never used it, but it was out there. Um, and because uh, it was associated with about 5%, 7% weight loss. And finally, they, they thought they were going to make a killing and use this drug as a part of diabetes therapy, right? So what they did was they randomized 10,000 patients, uh, g gave them the drug versus placebo, followed them for three or four years. So just like you would do a study for a statin, looked at combined cardiac outcomes just like you would for a statin, um, and basically showed uh, that the people who t got the cybutramine died 16% more than people who got the sugar pill. So sort of the same kind of experience we saw with the antioxidant vitamins, although this is a prescription drug that had been already approved by the FDA and in use by millions of people around the world because it was tested based on weight loss and not based upon the diseases that we care about. Remember, obesity is not a number. Obesity is a, a metabolic syndrome associated with cardiovascular disease and other complications, and this particular drug killed people uh, uh, with an increase of 16%. So the drug was withdrawn from the market almost immediately, and what it's done is it's made the FDA raise the bar before they accept most other new drugs. So I think that's a good thing, because this is the kind of literature we know from statins, we know it from blood pressure pills, we know it from some diabetes pills. It's what we expect of, of the FDA. Uh, this kind of proof, uh, and we shouldn't be using drugs just because it lowers weights a little bit. I think that's all I'll say about weights, uh, and just just a few words, I mean drugs, say just a few words about surgery. Al Roker's kept it off mostly. So uh, we've done that. So here are the types of surgery. So um, this is interesting. Um, there are really two basic ways to um, change the, the GI tract for weight loss. One, you can make the stomach smaller, that's called uh, restrictive, or you can create a process whereby the body does not absorb nutrients uh, in the normal manner. So you create a malabsorption syndrome um, uh, by manipulating uh, the GI tract. The problem with this type is that the old version of this, the GI bypass, uh, patients like this because you can eat a lot. Uh, and then you get some malabsorption, um, which is unpleasant, but with oily diarrhea, but whatever. Um, that's a joke. Uh, but, the, um, but with the GI bypass, there were a lot of long-term metabolic side effects. So that, that surgery was discontinued. And many of these are not that different, and we don't have long-term data on them. So most obesity bariatric surgeons, not all, but most bariatric surgeons are using primarily restrictive procedures. The Ruin Y gastric bypass, which is still in the United States the most common procedure, about 60, 70 percent of procedures, uh, is mostly restrictive. I'll show you pictures of all these. It's mostly restrictive, but you can create a malabsorption component uh, by making the Ruin loop a little bit longer. Um, but um, the primary uh, surgeries in the United States now are ruin y gastric bypass, most, which, mostly for its restrictive elements, uh, and sleeve gastrectomy, which is coming on strong, and adjustable gastric banding, which is uh, diminishing in popularity. And these are some of the uh, anatomy cartoons, uh, just to uh, make the point. So vertical banded uh, gastroplasty is an older procedure, but you can see um, they put in, they, so you keep the stomach in place, uh, uh, put in this clamp, make a, basically a, the stomach about 30 cc's, so the size of a surgeon's thumb, not my little thumb, but a, you know, a surgeon's big thumb, uh, about that size. Um, the gastric band tries to do that with this silastic band, which is uh, not permanent, but you have to have a, a, a port, uh, and the inflating it is uh, tricky. Uh, and then the ruin Y here, where you actually separate off the stomach and create uh, this uh, roux loop so that the food um, 
Uh, so mostly, again, you're experiencing this smaller uh, pouch, so you get early satiety. Now, of course, if you drink all your calories, you can beat this. Um, and so patients still need to understand uh, what a, a good diet is uh, pre and post operatively. And this is the sleeve gastrectomy, which is another procedure which is gaining in popularity. There's less um, literature on it. Um, it's um, technically a little easier than the Roux and Y, uh, but we don't have as much long term data. And the different procedures are associated with different amounts of weight loss. Um, the, the control is this blue line, um, and then um, the ver vertical banding and uh, unbanding procedures are intermediate. Uh, the sleeve is probably in there as well, and then the Ruin Y gives the best long-term weight loss. Now there is some re uh, weight gain. So um, but for, uh, the lap band was very popular. It was mostly done in uh, Australia and New Zealand, and. Um, with very good published results, uh, but, but as the surgeons here learned how to do it, the results were not as good. Um, and in fact, uh, several major studies uh, basically showing that lap band results in less good outcomes compared to other procedures. So um, this has sort of fallen out of favor uh, fairly dramatically. But it's easier to do, so again, there are many people out there doing it. But in, in big centers, it's fallen out of favor. I think. Uh, this just makes the point, um, again, this is from where that other slide comes from. I, I show this slide to show that if you follow people long enough, and this was 11 years, that people do keep the weight off, but not all of it. Um, so with the best procedures, say with uh, gastric bypass, um, it's about 30% max and about 20, 25% off at uh, 11 years. So these, these procedures do work at lowering weight. Um, but patients definitely need to be taught uh, how to uh, keep it off. So in, in summary, just some numbers to remember. So a regular diet, about 7.5% of your baseline weight. Uh, an extreme, very low-calorie diet is double that, so 15%. And surgery is double that, or 30%. So that's how I think about it, different gradations of, of, of weight effectiveness. And uh, I won't go over this in great detail, except to say that everything, all the metabolic parameters get better with all of these procedures. And there's no question that anything you can do to get the weight down makes all these uh, metabolic parameters better. That's true with surgery, but it's also true with uh, diet. Um, the problem, like all elective surgeries, is that there are risks. And the real challenge for a non-surgeon uh, who's referring a patient for surgery is really trying to define the harms as well as the benefits. And it's that balancing act that makes uh, these decisions so hard. Um, and our surgeons and all surgeons uh, report uh, verbally that their results are much better than what I'm about to show you. Uh, and, so I, and all I can do is show you what's been written. Uh, and so this is from the literature. This is from uh, slightly older, uh, 2009, but it's from uh, the best group of sort of centers of excellence and cons consortium. And the 30-day overall mortality was 0.3%, uh, um, and it varied a little bit by the procedure. The laparoscopic procedures were safer than the open procedures. Part of that is selection, though. They usually have to do the open in really big patients, five, 600-pound patients. Uh, but if you, if you look at more composite uh, side effects, not only death, but also th thromboembolic disease, the need for a repeat operation or a prolonged hospital stay, now it's up to uh, 4% or 1 out of 25, uh, and again, with some range. So again, patients just need to understand the risks. Uh, and I think the main take-home point here is that, like in everything in medicine, there are benefits and harms, even vitamins, and we talked about earlier today. Um, and also that you want to have this done at a place that does a lot of them and does it really well. I think that's probably the most important point. If you look at Medicare data, uh, so now we're looking at older patients in the community, uh, the one-year mortality, uh, the 30-day mortality, instead of being 0.3% is 2%, and the one-year mortality is up to 5%. So there's a wide range of experience here, and again, it's a good reason to come to a good place. Oh, and then finally, there's been a debate about whether uh, the surgery, since everything's going in the right direction, you would think that bariatric surgery would save lives. 
and it was finally shown to do so. It took 11 years of follow-up. Um, but the number needed to treat is almost 1,000. So if you, you need, in other words, you need to do about 800 operations a year to prolong life in one person. So, uh, and the longer you follow, the, the longer that is because there's a lot of early uh, risks. So again, this is not uh, a public health cure, but I think as the operation clearly gets better, uh, more and more people are having good results with it. So we do refer patients for it. We have an excellent team here at UCSF. Uh, the important thing is just to understand the benefits and harm discussion. This is not nothing, this is big. I think I'll uh, stop. And then uh, there are nutritional issues that need to be considered. Uh, we don't have time for that for now. So let me just uh, conclude. Um, there was a nice article in the New England Journal a month ago, a couple, uh, six months ago or so, um, that talked, it was called Facts About Obesity. So this is just, I took their facts and just sort of give you my opinion about their facts, uh, most of which I agree with, um, and just as a way to summarize. Uh, not all of these things that I talk about, but um, increasingly we know that environmental changes do work. So the experience in New York and Philadelphia and LA and the school districts uh, and the sugar taxes, um, we're optimistic and we think that we've learned a tremendous amount from advocacy around uh, tobacco control uh, with uh, tremendous opportunities uh, in food and nutrition. So this is going to be a, a challenge, a battle for the rest of our life. Uh, but it does suggest that in terms of teaching our students and our, our kids and so forth, that they have to become activists here in order to uh, make this work. Diets work, but not for long in most people is what they said. What I said is, yes, uh, that's true. But remember that there's always a group out there for whom they really work great. So it's about a quarter of all people really get their act together and really uh, can change their lives. Uh, exercise improves uh, health independent of weight change and aid in weight maintenance. Uh, that's an enthusiastic yes. Uh, the continuation of conditions that promote weight loss promotes weight maintenance. Strong yes. Uh, for children, uh, programs that involve parents and, uh, and home promote greater weight loss. I think that's probably true, although the evidence is still developing. Um, provision of meals and meal replacement products promote greater weight loss. That's what I showed you. That's how we do. That's how we achieve our very low calorie diet, but they only work in the short term. Uh, medications can help meaningful weight loss as long as uh, agents uh, can be used. This is where I mostly disagree, uh, because we don't have very good out, uh, data about the longer term clinical outcomes. And I think as a community, we should demand that as the next generation or three of uh, weight loss drugs gets developed. Uh, and surgery results in long-term weight loss and reductions of diabetes and mortality, uh, but should be balanced with uh, the comment that uh, uh, with complications in some and many, uh, and you have to treat a lot of people to save a life. So here are my final uh, goals. Uh, when I see a patient, whether they come to see me for weight loss or, or I just, as a regular doctor, see that their body mass index is elevated, this is immediately where I go in my thinking and my teaching. Um, and, and so I, the first thing I do is I change the subject. Uh, so instead of talking about weight, I talk about fitness. So role, goal number one, be as fit as you can possibly be at your current weight. Uh, and as was, the anecdote was told earlier, uh, you can be overweight and still be quite fit. Number two, prevent further weight gain. This is a totally acceptable goal in the office or for public health for a large number of patients since uh, the default is to gain weight in our society, so you need a strategy to keep your weight the same. Uh, and then in some patients, if you're successful at one and two, uh, there are options for weight loss, and we discussed uh, what some of those are. Eat less and exercise more, that's the most ridiculous fad diet I've heard of yet. Uh, <laughs> but uh, been talking about this subject for a while, but it's still the punchline. Um, but uh, I think now, uh, with much more attention to the environmental and public health aspects of this, I think we really have a chance to turn this one around. So thank you very much for your hard work on this and your attention.